Let's go. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. I'm your host, David Horsager. Join me as I sit down with influential leaders from around the world to discuss why leaders and organizations fail, top tactics for high performance, and how you can become an even more trusted leader. Welcome to The Trusted Leader Show. I'm Kent Svensson, producer of The Trusted Leader Show. And today we have a very special episode for you. This is the 62nd and last episode of 2021. We have thoroughly enjoyed sharing each of these 62 episodes with you. We have people listening from all over the world, across almost 70 countries, 50 states, and six continents. And by the way, if you or someone you know is going to be going to Antarctica, we would love to make it seven out of seven continents. But seriously, though, on behalf of David, myself, and the entire team, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing each of these episodes with your family, with your friends, with your employees, customers, and clients. Thank you for reviewing the show. And thank you for all of your feedback and comments. We could not do this without you. So thank you. But as this is the last episode of 2021, we thought it'd be fun to take a quick look back on some of the best moments from the year. So we put together a compilation of best moments from some of our most popular episodes and from some of the episodes we've gotten the most feedback and comments on and put it together in a compilation for you. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a compilation of best moments from the 2021 The Trusted Leader Show. Up first, we have Horst Schultze from episode 20, where he talks about the three universal expectations of the customer. You know, you talk about three universals. Tell us about those. Well, the, the, the expectation of the customer, I guess that's what we talk about. Yeah, the ex- well, yes, it's in universal. The market, you can look at the market over there, what is a market or potential market, and you, there are two or three things for sure they want. So you better have processes and systems or measurements if you deliver it. And that's a subconscious expectation, like what you have, anybody has. You want the product to be defect free. You know, uh, uh, taking, I always use an example of a bottle of water. If you buy a bottle of water, you don't want anything to swim in there. You expect subconsciously that it is defect free. Number two, very important, by the way, and you have to underline it 10 times, is timeliness. Everything today is very important that your timely responses, that you, you, you want that bottle of water when you want it. And you want an immediate answer to your email, et cetera, et cetera, timeliness. So no defect. Timeless. And number three, what you want, the one the people that give it to you, the bottle of water or whatever it is, to be nice to you, to care for you. Now, here's the, here's the crazy thing. I mean, and, and, and why businesses don't get that? The greatest driver of eventual satisfaction, eventual loyalty is the caring piece, which means you have to, you have to, process and make sure that there is excellence and relationship between your employees, between you and those that buy from you. The, the product is not creating loyalty. Loyalty is nothing but trust. They trust you. There are three types of customer, very fast as the, the one that distrust you, who are, who, are, uh, who are terrorists against your company. Now they go on social media, they, Whatever destroy you, then they're the loyal, then they're the satisfied one. They got night next door if they, they think there's a better deal. And then there's the one that are loyal to you. Why are they loyal? They're trusting you. And trust is not created with a product, it's created with the relationship moment. Only the relationship. Next up from episode 46, we have M. Gasby Brown, where she talks about the importance of racial literacy, humility, and sustainability in bringing about change and diversity that allows each of us to be able to enjoy the great benefits of diversity. Let's jump to DEI. It's a big topic, DEI and justice, some say in belonging these days, but diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, you know, we talk about trust, and it's you, you can't. It seems like you can't have the best kind. At least there was a there was a study on diversity, uh, Harvard, massive Harvard Putnam study that showed kind of diversity that diversity of many kinds on its own tends to pit people against each other, unless you increase trust. So we're all about how do we increase trust to get the best of that we know there you know we know there is greatness in diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, justice. So how do we increase trust? 
uh, so that we enjoy the best of this beautiful array of diversity. But I'd like to just talk to you. How do you how do you tackle DEI in a way, or how can we as leaders maybe even think differently about it so that we increase trust and get the best of diversity? Boy, that's a great question, David. Um, and the onus is really more on the learnee than the learned in this case, in my mind. And so it really comes down to, and I will deal with the racial part of it because there's so many moving parts to DEI and justice. Uh, There needs to be uh, racial literacy, a curiosity that uh, to learn and openness to learn and to be a lifelong learner about the various historical issues that have led us to where we are now with regard to racial equity. There needs to also be, in my mind, I kind of deal with three R's, R's and C's and what have you, but another R would be uh, racial humility. There are some people who feel that they have read a few books and they have watched a couple of movies and documentaries, and now they know all they need to know and they maybe would attended a couple of DEI trainings and they know they feel that they know all there is to know about uh, racial reckoning and what's going on but that is the wrong attitude the attitude has to be humility where you're putting yourself in the position to always be open to learning new things and more and then the the racial sustainability that you're in this for the long haul this is not just a flashpoint in history but this is an opportunity. Next up from episode 50, we have Jay Bear, where he talks about why word of mouth is critical for business growth and why every business needs to have a word of mouth strategy. Dave, the, the premise is this. We trust people more than we trust any leader or organization or government or media. Um, We trust each other the most. And we always have going all the way back to caveman days where somebody said, well, who, which caveman sells the sharpest, you know, arrowheads like, well, you know, Glog, he's the man, right? I mean, it's the, it's the recommendations from, from your peers are the ones that carry the most weight. And the fundamental premise of the book, and while it's really written for, for a a business kind of company uh, perspective, it applies to individuals and, and, and speakers and parents and spouses as well. The premise is that the best way to grow any business or any audience or trust is for your customers to do that growing for you. And I think we all know that to be true, right? Like if you ask businesses, hey, how important is word of mouth to your business? They will all say important, all of them. Yet, and this part is the thing that makes this book so important, nobody has an actual strategy to do it. The actual data from John Jantz is that fewer than 1% of all businesses have an actual word of mouth strategy. Fewer than 1%, yet you've got a strategy for everything else, right? You got a, you got a, a leadership strategy, a trust strategy, if you follow Dave and you should. You've got a PR strategy, crisis strategy, hiring strategy, you know, diversity strategy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, marketing strategy, of course, social media strategy. But the one thing you don't have a strategy for is perhaps the most important thing at all, of all, which is why should people tell your story? I think the most something really interesting that seems like almost a, a contradiction at first. We've got this guy, one of the one of the most sought after thought leaders in the world on digital and marketing, mm-hmm. and you hear so much you know Shazam in those spaces. And here, Jay Bear is saying it is all about word of mouth. That's the as much as you've done in the space of digital. And yeah. by the way, you can use digital, uh, but it's sure. this whole this whole piece of Kind of what I loved about it is it got back to truth, to authenticity, to what are real people really saying, not um, right. we did it, you know, in our study, we found that continually like reviews, online reviews are tanking because people don't trust them. Whereas uh, what you hear from someone specifically that, you know, is that that's trust right. is going up immensely. And I think that's just it's really interesting in this space. Right. Yeah, you're exactly right. There is more uh, online word of mouth now. Uh, than ever before because of social media, the prevalence of ratings and review sites, et cetera. So, so mathematically, the volume of online word of mouth is higher, especially in the pandemic, because there's just not as many occasions for offline word of mouth than there uh, compared to pre-pandemic. 
However, the impact of offline word of mouth, uh, somebody you actually know at your kid's soccer game or what have you, is higher because you have that existing relationship with the person who is passing the story along. And, and people ask me a lot, Dave, like, well, okay, I don't get this. If, if businesses know that word of mouth is important, how is it then that they don't have a strategy for it? Like what, I mean, you know, this it's 2022 almost like, you know, word of mouth has been around for thousands of years. How is it that people don't have a strategy? And, and here's why. Almost every business or leader makes the same mistake. And the mistake is believing that competency creates conversation. That if you run a good organization or you are trusted and you're good at execution, that, that naturally people will notice that and will talk about it. And that seems right on paper, it does, but it's not actually right in the real world because that's not how human beings behave. Every person in the world, including you and me and everybody tuning in, is wired the same way. We are wired to discuss things that are different and ignore things that are expected. Let me tell you about this experience I had last night. It was perfectly adequate. Said nobody in history, right? If I went over here and, and flicked the switch and these lights went off in my office, I wouldn't be like, Dave, you won't believe what happened. When I hit these, the switch, the lights went off. You know why? Because that's how lights work. And we all know that. So there isn't a story there. Word of mouth is just a story. And you being good at your job isn't a story because that's what they expect Right. That's why it's really, really hard for restaurants, for example, to create word of mouth around food quality and sort of tastiness, unless it's just a beyond, beyond crazy. Because guess what? If you're buying a meal in a restaurant, you expect it to be good. That's the whole point. Right. So you don't get conversational credit for doing exactly what customers expect you to do. And that's the mistake that everybody makes. They just focus on competency, which is important. Don't get me wrong. Competency keeps your customers, but competency doesn't create stories because it's just like, yeah, of course they do that. All right, sure. Hey everyone, a quick interruption here to share some big news. April 12th through the 14th, you are invited to the Trusted Leaders Summit. What makes a powerful event is bringing together amazing people in a way that actually makes an impact in the world. We're talking about a get together that is packed with immediately useful content. You'll hear from top leaders like John Foley, the former lead solo pilot for the Blue Angels, Harvard professor Alison Shapira, and more incredible global experts. Get your tickets before they're gone at trustedleadersummit.com and join us in becoming even more trusted leaders. We can't wait to see you there. Next up from episode 22, we have Susan Sly, where she talks about how to lock in the desire to actually build a new habit. So let's take let's go back to habits one step. You know, how do you build a new one? Like if you're if you're starting with a new habit, like you're like, well, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna start running every day. But then they get to tomorrow, and it doesn't become a habit, as you know. Um, mm -hmm. Most people wouldn't do what you did. They gasped after hundred yards, and they went back to bed the next day. So yeah. breaking through and building a new habit. Any tips? Sure, that's a, an amazing question. It's it really starts with desire. And, and here are my tips for locking, uh, you know, really locking down that desire. It's number one is ask yourself the question, precisely what is the habit? Define it clearly. I want to run for 30 minutes a day, not I want to start running. Um, you know, I'll chase you down the street, you'll start running, but it might not become a habit. Like be very clear. Number two is what is the benefit to you of developing this habit? And, and list as many as you can. And then number three is, what is the detriment if you don't develop the habit? And then number four is, who in your life is suffering because you don't have this habit? And then the fifth thing is, what will this habit mean to you five or 10 years down the road? Because it's the compound effect like Darren Hardy talks about. So I'll give you an example. So if viewers can see me, I've got in my hand, it's a glass, made in the USA glass bottle. It's empty of gloopy green stuff. So last year I decided, David, I'm like, you know what? I need to have more fr fresh fruits and vegetables. The Framingham study um, is the longest study done on cardiovascular health, but as an ancillary um, finding, 
they found that if you consume five to seven servings of fresh fruits and vegetables a day, it reduces your risk of cancer of all kinds by 70%. So I was going through my day eating, you know, eating, having protein shakes and, you know, raw almonds and all that good stuff. But I realized I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm not getting enough fresh fruits and vegetables. So I decided what I was going to do on Sunday is I was going to take, um, you know, greens. I was going to take organic celery, lemon juice in the Vitamix. I was going to mix this all up and I was going to, um, fill five jars, one for every day of the week. And, um, I was going to grab them. And, and that's what I did. Now it was really inconvenient because I had to like dedicate that time on Sunday to making this gloopy green drink. And then the second thing was I had to figure out a way to make this a habit that it was so convenient that I had no excuse, like even running out of my house to my office, I could just grab it out of the fridge and I could go. So that was a habit I developed last year. And now it's so ingrained in me because I'm going, the detriment is the benefit is I reduce my risk of cancer. And then the detriment is if I don't do this, I'm not getting enough fresh fruits and vegetables. Maybe I could get cancer. Right. And you think about all the people in my life, the benefit, that's just an example. I love it. (laughs) Great, great five-step process. Next from episode 25, we have Bob Stromberg, where he talks about the two words that describe creativity and why all of us can be creative. Tell us about this how did you become so creative? And uh, give us a little window into that slice of your expertise. Five or six years ago, um, uh, well, it was, it was September 15th of uh, 2015. I was right here in the basement of this house, digging through some boxes of books and uh, looking for some books. And I found some old work calendars, a pile of them about like this. And the earliest one went back to 1975. And I thought to myself, I wonder what I was doing on September 15th, 2015, 40 years to the date earlier. And so I opened it up to 2015, I mean, to to, to 1975, which was 40 years earlier. And there was my first professional booking with my friend, Michael. And uh, I, ca- I came upstairs. I said to my wife, Judy, Judy, this is like a celebration. I mean, the anniversary, we should be celebrating. And she said, huh. And that was the extent of the celebration right there. That was, <laughs> that was all there was. But I, that got me thinking when I realized, oh, my goodness, I have done this full-time, self-employed, never had a job, never had an employer who paid, well, I, thousands of them, but never never an employer that I was working for steadily. Uh, how have I done that? And I realized that I have been utilizing this thing called creativity. And I also realized I had never given a lot of thought to what it actually is and how it works. And I started thinking about all these plays that I had written. All Recently, I've been writing uh, screenplays um, and the comedy material and lots and lots of music that I've written through the years. All these creative things. What do they have in common? Where did they come from? How did they come to be? And I realized that... And this took a, this took a number of months of thinking about this, really working through it. I realized that everything that I have created came from a place and through a process. And the place that the place that these things came from, the songs, the plays, the comedy routines, the bits, the one-liners, they came from what I call my creative reservoir, which you have as well. And they came through a process. Uh, and the process is called creativity. And I believe that uh, that there are two words. You, you need two words to really describe what creativity actually is. And I believe the two words are gift and craft. Usually we think of creativity being a gift. People say, oh, I couldn't be creative. My my brother was is so creative. He really had a gift of creativity, but I just never had that. Um, and, and I say, well, you, uh, you, you had something because when you were a child, uh, you demonstrated that here's the deal. I really believe that the gift you, you, you're born with something of creativity, but you're not born creative. Here's what I think the gift is, David, the gift that, that we are all born with all of us is a, a desire and a capacity to experience creativity. 
So I'm, we come out of the womb that way with a desire and a capacity to experience it. And we open up that gift immediately when we're born. I mean, the first thing that you, uh, within weeks, you're you're learning that you can roll from, I don't know if it's weeks, I can't remember. It's been so long since my kids, even my grandkids were that small. So I thought you were going to say, it's been so long since you rolled over yeah. for the first time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but to roll from your back to your front, boy, that was exciting. You couldn't wait to do that. It's a little scary to do that. You can see, you can see the baby's eyes just, did I? just do that. That's experiencing creativity, getting up on your knees and rocking back and forth. Oh boy, that's fun. And then piling up blocks at some point and then knocking them over. It, 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 all of this was play or or uh, taking that crayon and rubbing it across the paper, making those marks on the paper was so fun. Or as it was the case in my family with our four-year-old who is, who is now a, a remarkable artist and was then to take that pink magic marker and coloring and all color in all the the white flowers on mom and dad's new couch that was an exciting <laughs> that was an exciting day at our our family all of this was what we refer to and what psychologists call and, and child development people call play it was just play but it was all creativity it was all creative incredible uh, um, demonstration of creativity so the question is well, where does that go? Because so many people say, I'm, I'm not creative. I couldn't create anything. I mean, I'm, I have no idea what I would do. I can't create anything. You know, I'm just not a creative person. You used to be. So where did it go? And I believe, um, and, and I, I, I believe it gets educated right out of us in the Western world. I think it's just, it's just the downside of our educational system, a lot of good things about our educational system, but not in this regard of creativity. Because in school, we learned very early on, when we're taking a test or a quiz or an exam, we have to write in the right word in the fill in the blank. It's got to be the right word. Or if it's a multiple choice, you have to you have to circle the right answer. Or if you if it's a, a a math problem, you have to add those numbers all up and divide it and do this and, and the hypotenuse of whatever. And it's got to be down to the down to the right decimal point in number. It's got to be perfect. And if it's not, it gets a big red mark on it, and we deal with our feelings about uh, about getting those red marks on our paper. And we very early um, realize. Um, that we're not as creative as we used to be. Things are not as fun as they used to be. Creativity does not work that way. Creativity is not about finding the right answer. Creativity is about trying many, many potential answers. Some of them, which are really not good answers at all, but to try them um, and something else comes out of it. Uh, you, you you almost can't fail with creativity because you're not looking at the outcome. You're looking at the process. So to to engage in the process, um, even if it's to try lots of things, in other words, you don't need to get the one right answer. So therefore, I think there's another word that's necessary. Gift is the first one. I think the other word to describe what creativity is and how it works, the, the other important word is craft. Creativity is a craft. It's a process that you go through. And as you go through this process, you begin to, this is a wonderful side benefit, you begin to fill up your creative reservoir. So there's there's always something there. You don't need to worry about writer's block. You don't need to worry about not being able, what am I going to do now? It's all, you've got lots of stuff ready to go. and But you need to understand what the process is. Next up from episode 59, we have Ryan Leak, where he talks about why all of us should be chasing failure. You know, if I look at your life and what you're about, you've done some amazing things, but it is marked by this risk-taking, this willingness to chase failure. And I love what you say in the book even. Basically, the the own the people you admire the people you love the people you look up to they all failed right. and yet we're all sitting here thinking we want to get around the failure we want to and and you kind of make this yeah. this point of let's chase failure if we want to be like that absolutely you just i think we all if let's say we're a songwriter we all want to write a hit song you only want to write hits but you got to write some bad songs to get a hit song you got to miss some shots to make some shots i mean it's all a part of 
it's all a part of the process. No matter anybody in this world that wants to do anything, uh, they have to try things. And I think the last three years, somebody said this to me the other day, they said, I'm not sure if I'm ready for my junior year of COVID. And I just thought, has it been that long? It really has. But I'd like to say the last three years have really taught us that if, if you're not innovating, if you're not thinking outside the box, you may not survive in this marketplace that, that we work in because things are constantly changing. And most people don't like change. And COVID-19 did not ask us for permission. Right. And so I think people now more than ever have to be willing to try some things and take some risks. Next from episode 43, we have Cheryl Batchelder, where she talks about why we should be training leaders to be stewards. I, I picked this up in, in your book and it's a subtlety, but it, it it's not, I'm going to get into some principles in the book, but it's a subtlety of how you say things that made me just so impressed with who you are. And the word, um, you said it already. Oh, you said stewards. It's, it's, it's not this feeling of these are the people I lead. It's, these are the people, in fact, you said it in the book several times, I can't even remember the wording, but something like, these are the per- people I'm I'm charged with leading or I'm I'm given to lead or I'm I'm kind of called to steward and it's it's like the investor does I'm we're there to steward we're not that it's 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 such a different feel of humility and I, I know you've been influenced by uh you said it there with Collins uh level 5 with a you know humility with ambition but you know tell us where that that humility came from that seems genuine and that is something I see missing in the leaders I walk you know, alongside uh, that I'm consulting or working with? Well, I, I agree. It's largely absent. It's culturally absent to um, honor and uphold uh, stewardship as a leadership trait. In fact, so much so today, I was being interviewed by a large big four um, accounting firm that you would recognize. And on the subject of ESG, uh, which one of the aspects of ESG is governance in boardrooms. And he said, what thing are we not measuring in the boardroom that we should be measuring? And I said, you should be measuring the steward, the development of leaders as stewards. And the reason is because we have very few people with that mindset. And yet we're entrusting huge groups of people and huge amounts of resources to leaders in large companies or institutions, any institution you pick, right? And there's no training up of stewardship, belief, values, and behaviors, right, in our leaders. So why are we surprised that they don't steward it well? Why are we surprised that they don't create an environment where people feel treated with dignity? We shouldn't be surprised. We're not training it up. Uh, We're not expecting it. We're not measuring it like we do everything else in the business world, right? And so I... I use the word entrusted. I believe people and resources have been entrusted to my care as a leader. And my responsibility is to steward them well. Um, And if I steward them well, maybe I should get paid well and do well in life. But that's not the motive. The the motive is I am a leader who uh, has been entrusted with much and, and should steward it to its best possible outcome. I'm not in control of everything so far, right? But I should steward best I can uh, to a better outcome. So what does that look like in practice? I think it's real important to say, how do you do that? Not just philosophy. Um, And my whole premise at Popeye's that that the book is written around is what if we led this company as if the franchise owner who invested in the store, the people, the community was the center of the universe and we were to take care of them and set them up for success. And I said a million times, we will measure our success by their success. That's the only measure of my team's success is whether those franchise owners are more prosperous when we leave than when we got here. Um, Now, why is that rocket science? I really wonder, right? (laughs) I mean, it is a business model. They need to perform well to continue to invest in the business, to build more units or to innovate or all those ways that we invest. So why wouldn't I, as a leader, think of them as the point of service, the point of stewardship? Um, But, you know, franchisees in many, many organizations would tell you they are not valued. They are not treated with respect. Their uh, prosperity is not measured as a measure of the business success. I mean, 
I, I don't get it. And lastly, from episode 42, we have Bobby Herrera, who talks about why we should always be giving more than we take. Number three, I could pause on each of these and be uh, moved and thinking of my, my own, I'm processing as I have before with your work, but am I giving more than I'm taking? I think probably the best way to describe that is, uh, you know, I'm going to borrow a quote from a gentleman whose work I've studied quite a bit. Uh, is a Jesuit priest named Anthony DeMello. Uh, very, very wise, you know, spiritual and, uh, uh, you know, teacher of, of just good principles. And, you know, he has a metaphor that he uses, you know, every day the sun comes out and it shines. And not once does a sun ever say to the earth, you owe me. It just gives. And, you know, I believe that one of the single most important characteristics in leadership, and this applies to fatherhood, to friendship, is just giving more than you take, you know, because, you know, when you truly give, you don't wait for a third act. You know, you give, the person receives. And too often, I believe, you know, we wait for a third act. We keep a scorecard or we want something in return, but that's not really giving. You know, our cup should be full by shining and just knowing that in giving, there are two acts, giving and receiving. And when you learn to eliminate that third act, I think that's when you're really living and appreciating the power of giving. That's it for this week's episode. Be sure to check out trustedleadershow.com for all the show notes and information on anything mentioned in today's episode. And if you haven't already, we would greatly appreciate a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform as this is a great way to help support the show and to help other people to discover it. Again, on behalf of David, myself, and the entire team, we just want to say thank you for being a part of the Trusted Leader Show. We can't wait to share with you the incredible guests we have lined up for 2022. But in the meantime, thank you for being a part of the show. Have a happy new year. And until next time, stay trusted.